Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dovert. Uh, before I start my presentation, I first of all am honored and overwhelmed uh, by the organizer, IRASIC, ASEAN uh, Study Center, ASEAN Indo, uh, India at RIS, for giving me this opportunity to share my view of the role of ASEAN in this probably uh, very competitive uh, region uh, in the coming years. And <clears throat> I must also thank uh, Mr. Chairman that at the outset, you mentioned about diversity. Uh, this is exactly what I intend to pitch uh, in my uh, paper or in my presentation uh, to share with you. How do I share my paper in this Zoom? I think I have 12 minutes to, to go, right? Uh, where, where I is need it? for colleagues to allow you to share, but I think it should be done already. Somebody has, uh, has already shared the paper or you can just put onto the screen. No, I, I don't know how to use this. Uh... Okay, yeah, I got it. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is the one that I wanted to share. Do you see the, 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 the... on the screen, do you see my paper? No, not yet. No? No. Uh... You can, yeah, now it has come. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have about 12 minutes uh, uh, to make my case. Am I right? You're right. All right, uh, I'll try to be short. And uh, I have prepared uh, this paper by paragraph, by numbering my paragraphs, about 25 of them. And anyone who wished uh, to clarify or comment or ask questions, please refer to the numbering of. Uh, the paragraph uh, later on. And <clears throat> I congratulate all earlier uh, speakers uh, who were outstanding and impressive in their contents and uh, ideas that uh, they shared with us uh, since this morning. And I will not get into the detail of what already have been uh, repeatedly said in the proceeding earlier on. And my focus is to draw why ASEAN can play a role using its diversity, draw a 4,000 years of history back to four ancient civilization. And <clears throat> we all know that there were four ancient civilization 4,000 years ago, Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, ancient India, and ancient China. And <clears throat> If we revisit uh, some historical textbook, we all know that uh, this civilization within itself, there were many wars and therefore the rise and fall of empires and kingdoms, not every day, of course, uh, occurred occasionally over a period of duration. And this rise and fall of empires and kingdoms uh, not only uh, created two very distinctive, uh, three distinctive uh, characteristics of the four uh, civilizations. Uh, <clears throat> the first characteristic which I contend here is in the West Asia or what we call now the Middle East, Many of these wars were fought as a result of competing conflicts within the uh, civilization and between uh, civilizations. And as such, uh, many of these uh, rivalries in order to justify or legitimize uh, their uh, warring uh, reasons, they for whatever reasons, we, of course, I'm not a historian, I don't understand why they have created a division between themselves and others, which 
basically means enemies. And this division is uh, the result of competing conflicts, competing conflicts style that still persist to present day after 4,000 years of history. And right now, what we have on the table here about rivalry between a group of allies and the alleged challenger, China, seems to be uh, in this uh, situation where one side will say you are the enemy, you are trying to uh, go against our view, and the other side, no, your side is rather unilaterally determined that we are the rivals. And this is a, a very bad uh, situation. And the second <clears throat> distinction uh, from this four civilization, which I argue in my short paper there, uh, is that China and Indian civilization, while there were many uh, wars within the civilization, it's also the war, they were also the war between kingdoms within the civilizations. However, uh, the wars that they happen may cause the rise and fall of empires or kingdom, but, but these two civilizations never did try to invade the territory outside of their sovereign territory, except for the Chinese civilization, except the Yuan dynasty, which basically not from the Chinese people, but are Mongolian, we call Mongol Empire, they have invaded a very broad territory you know, crossing into Euro-Asia continent. And therefore, what uh, on the table here that China is likely to be a very uh, dangerous aggressor may not sit well with respect to the historical fact that China has I mean, China, in the sense of the Chinese, not uh, the outsiders, has never been uh, aggressive uh, to other sovereign uh, territories. Instead, instead, Chinese civilization promoted harmony between a group of countries with uh, the Chinese dynasty. And this tributary system uh, respect uh, those countries that uh, are close uh, to China. And the way that they deal with the foreign relations in such a way that they remain and maintain harmony and reconciliation. So what, the con what is the contract, construct, contracts between uh, <clears throat> China civilization and other three civilization is that harmony and conciliation is a very distinctive uh, feature uh, in this part of Indo-Pacific. Whereas the Western civilization are more inclined uh, to, uh, to focus on conflict and resolutions, which is a result, which as a result, you create a war among a group of allies and another group of enemies. And <clears throat> the third uh, distinction is that Southeast Asia play a very important role in the fusion of Chinese and Indian civilization 2,020 years ago. And this not only fused uh, Chinese and Indian uh, culture, religions, and so on, they also have created a system of mutual respect and mutual uh, beneficiary uh, relationship in trade and economy relations. Uh, for more than uh, 2,000 years, and it still uh, continue until uh, today, and it will also continue uh, in the future. Many allegations uh, say that China is using a lot of its financial muscle to force many countries surrounding China to buy into the Chinese concept of one belt, one road. But to my understanding, the Chinese international cooperation is simply based on market economy. If a project does not make money, there is no point for China to spend so much money into 
a specific uh, project. The outcome of a successful project or a failure of many projects end up, be, end up in a way that China has built a good and strong relations with those beneficiary countries, that is fine. But that we must understand that that is not the original intention of why China is helping many countries. And on that basis, we are looking into some economic statistics historically. And I started with population and economy. When we look at the population, the reason that I choose population because population is a very important input for production. Although in the production function, you know, there is the law of diminishing, diminishing returns, whatever, not the endless uh, growth of population may uh, guarantee a higher level of output. Instead, the marginal productivity will eventually uh, diminish to zero, if not uh, to negative uh, ter terrain. And we see from table one on page two, year 1000, China and India has, are the two largest uh, country in terms of population. And these two countries continue to be two largest populated country in the world today. And 2020, we can see the combined population of China and India are about 2.8 billion of inhabitants. And our earth now has about 7.9 7 billion of population. And by looking at figures may not give the visual sense of what is the the, uh, the crucial uh, issue of the comparative comparison of population size. I have normalized the figures into zero from zero to one, and I've put it down into circles. And there are four circles representing year 1000, 1820, 2001, and 2020. You can see the size of selected countries and regions and China and India were the two countries that always occupied uh, the larger circles uh, over the last 1,000, uh, probably uh, 1,200 years. And when I, why did I choose 1820? 1820 was the year where China has the largest GDP in the world. And it has about close to 40, uh, 40, uh, 32% of global GDP in 1820. And India was the second largest economy in the world. So had more than 200 years, 201 years now, and China in PPP, in PPP US dollars term is already the largest economy in the world. And US is only number two. But in nominal term, yes, US is still huge and the largest economy and China is trying to catch up in terms of uh, nominal uh, US dollars. But over time, uh, China will eventually uh, over, overtake uh, US in terms of economy size. And as a result of this huge population size, and more importantly, the <clears throat> continuous progress of technological uh, science in China, and China has become a very powerful uh, uh, manufacturing uh, industrial country, even though the politic, uh, political aspect is uh, authoritarian communism uh, in, in the sense of political science. But in my opinion, uh, when, we term, when, we, when we coin China as a communist state, it probably is not correct because China is more likely to become a state capitalism instead of free market uh, capitalism. And that state capitalism by itself is not necessarily a bad thing because many things, many market failures happen because of information issues, because of institution problem, and these market failures require government intervention. Secondly, government intervene in the market to, to create new demand because government has the resources and capability to build new goods and services, but they require new demand and government has the ability to 
to encourage development of new products and services, but at the same time, they also be able to create new consumption in the economy. And that will have a great spillover effect to our global economy. And that economic CO effects are shown in table uh, three, where the figures of top 10 exporters and importers of the world from 2016 to 2020, you can see the figures in terms of export. China is the largest exporter in, 19, in 2016, and it is still the largest exporter in 2020. US is number two, German is number three, followed by Japan. The rest is not really important in terms of the size of the exports. And in terms of import, US is the largest importer in the world, while China's remain in the second. And that imbalance over a long period of time between US and China that create you know, uh, a very uh, strong rivalry, the sense of rivalry between US and China, especially during Trump administration four years. And <clears throat> goods by itself cannot truly underline the importance of China. And we also, I have also taken the liberty in examining you know, uh, the flow of financial resources. And these financial resources, as I show in table four, we can see there are many countries that encourage and solicit, soliciting a lot of inward foreign direct investment. However, the largest FDI inflow country is still US and followed by China. But the size of population in China is three times more than uh, US and the potential of higher growth capacity is still on China and therefore China will still continue to attract a lot of foreign direct investment inflow in the coming, coming years. I don't mean coming five years or coming 10 years, probably it will be coming decades continuously. And this will also facilitate a win-win situation where foreign investor will make profit in China and China will also benefit from their investment to create a higher value product and services, and at the same time also to generate new products and new services that will cater for the demand of global economy. And money by itself cannot solve all problems and also cannot explain the importance of China in our global uh, environment. And I also therefore uh, examine the number of international travelers in 2010 and 2019. And I have found that, and the data does not lie, and China, uh, US has the largest inbound tourists in 2019, about 79 uh, million of tourists, followed by China uh, of 66 uh, million of inbound tourists, and then Germany, UK, Thailand, Japan, and Malaysia. However, uh, many of these countries, not to mention uh, the aftermath of COVID-19, I suspect many uh, tourists, uh, the, the number of tourists will shrink, but that, that contraction of tourist size, in fact, does not really impede the, uh, the relevancy of globalization where people, money, goods, services, and money information flow freely across uh, national boundaries. And in that respect, China will still, uh, China still will have a huge attraction for millions of people, whether they are super rich or they are middle class or probably, you know, upper class, or upper class or low, uh, upper level of uh, lower class income. Uh, Professor, people. it's time to conclude, I'm afraid, already right. time passed okay. by. So the rest, of, the rest of my argument is to focus on whether we should have cooperation or competitive uh, conflict. My assertion is instead of you know, fighting between one another, it is more 
productive and mutually benefit if we can have a stronger cooperative relationship, even among the contenders and even, even among the conflicting uh, groups of countries. And for that to happen, I propose that we organize more dialogues between all parts of stakeholders in multi-level, in multi-layer uh, manner. And certainly the promotion of uh, pluralism require uh, a precondition is diversity. And ASEAN has the diversity in the last 2000 years. And therefore ASEAN plays a, can play a very important role in using diversity to promote uh, pluralism. Of course, diversity and pluralism is entirely two separate things. We know that unity in diversity, but unity in diversity does not produce pluralism. And therefore, in order to create pluralism, we have to re visit and we understand what is the actual diversity that we have and what are the advantages we can take off to take it off and bring to the table to encourage more dialogue uh, so that a serious and continuous uh, dialogue will create a situation where there are a group of people will agree to disagree and there are also a group of people will agree to agree and the conflicting view will continue to, uh, to be discussed over time. And therefore, uh, this conference by itself is uh, a, 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 a very uh, good example of how important is conversation. And in that regard, I think ASEAN can play a very crucial role in promotion of conversations, not within ASEAN, what the previous speaker, Dr. David Anwar, mentioned the centrality of the drive towards prosperity, stability, and peaceful coexistence in Indo-Pacific require a driver that can promote and carry the flag of diversity into pluralism, which as a result will minimize the possibility of you know, conflict among a group of rivalry countries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks a lot, Professor. Um, it was a, a really interesting point of view and, and a, a, a good approach on the way uh, um, historically China has promoted the harmony, co-prosperity and mutual respect and is still uh, ready to do so through a, tribu a, tip, uh, sorry, through a, a tributary system. I'm not very, very sure that uh, it will exactly match with the point of view of the ASEAN because of the tributary system. But this is a, really a challenge and a debate that's very interesting and give me the occasion to, uh, uh, to introduce our next uh, panelist, uh, Professor Jose B. Santarita. Uh, 